Yeah. Great. All right, everyone. Um, welcome to week six in Oxford Minds. It's a real pleasure to have you here. My name is Susan James Relly. I'm the Associate Head for Education. And um, with Alex Betts, we've been organising the Oxford Minds series um, last academic year and, and for this term uh, in this academic year. This term we're focusing more on methods and we've got an amazing panel lined up for you. Um, it's really great to see everyone here. I was commenting on the, the fantastic attendance, 64 of you, 65 now. It's clearly a need across the division and, and it's really about how we can bring together the, the great minds of Oxford on the topics that Oxford is mindful of. Um, especially around inter interdisciplinarity and, and working across the social sciences. We've got such a wealth of knowledge and expertise across our um, 15 different faculties, schools and departments that um, it's been an absolute delight this term to hear of all the different um, disciplinary perspectives. I'm going to hand over now to Alex, who's going to introduce our fabulous panel, um, but welcome. And please remember to use the um, Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screens. Thanks. Thanks very much, Susan. It's really exciting to be able to have this conversation on the topic of intersectionality, making sense of power and identity. Intersectionality is one of those concepts that since Kimberly Crenshaw wrote about it, scholars across disciplines have used and has been very central to thinking about identity across areas, categories, gender, social class, uh, nationality, ethnicity, race. Um, but it's also an area that's contested, contested theoretically, concepted, contested methodologically, and where different disciplines have received and appropriated the concept for a range of purposes. And I think it's brilliant that this evening we've got three different scholars who to different degrees, either implicitly or explicitly, use intersectionality in their work and think about questions of power and its relationship to identity. All of them may have different engagement with the concept of identity. All of them have different geographical focuses in their work, and they come from different disciplinary perspectives. But what they have in common, I think, is a very serious empirical, theoretical, and methodological engagement with topics that connect in different ways themes of intersectionality, power, and identity. So we'll begin first with initial comments from Professor Rosella Kichia, who is Associate Professor of Social Policy in the Department for Social Policy and Intervention. And her work focuses very much on gender inequality in Europe, and particularly with focus, a focus on areas such as care and paid work. Then we'll move to Professor Nick Owen, who's Associate Professor of Politics and co-head of department in the Department of Politics and International Relations. He's author of a recent book called Other People's Struggles, which covers several of the areas of his work that I think are directly related to this theme. Political histories that look at struggles against imperialism, the women's liberation movement, and the role of the British left in bringing progressive political change. Finally, we'll move to Professor Nikita Sood, who is Associate Professor of Development Studies and Vice Gerent of Wolfson College, Nikita's work focuses on the politics of development in South Asia and addresses themes of the state, nationalism, neoliberalism, and the ways in which they interconnect in challenging ways in both rural and urban contexts. So I think we're gonna cover an awful lot and hopefully leave lots of room for Q&A. If during the course of the conversation, you want to ask a question, put it in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible. So, Let's come first of all to you, Rosella, over to you. Thank you, Alex, um, and, and thank you for, for inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, so I, I thought to start this talk actually by telling you uh, what I'm not going to do and then, and then move on to, and proceed to tell you a number of ways in which I think intersectionality is relevant and useful in my own field of research, which is that of social policy and welfare states. So what I'm not going to, not going um, to do is to actually discuss the definition of intersectionality, and that's because I don't think there is a single definition. Uh, there are many and, and often contradictory uh, ways in which we talk and use intersectionality. Uh, and this also depends on the fact that it is used by different audiences, uh, activists, 
first of all, academics, but also international organizations, the UN and the EU are increasingly resorting to the language of intersectionality. Now, I think that this fussiness or fluffiness uh, uh, of intersectionality can be actually a strength of the concept. But this is maybe something we can discuss uh, in the we can discuss later all together. So uh, if there is no single definition of intersectionality, then my question is how do we assess whether something is intersectionality or not? Does anything, can anything be called intersectionality? Now I would say that most people working with intersectionality would agree that there is a set of core ideas that are typical of an intersectional inquiry. And I want to particularly highlight three that are, that are central to my own understanding and to the way I use it in my own research. So first, I think intersectionality to me is a framework to studying multiple inequalities in a relational way. Second, with regard to the shape that this relation takes, uh, I think we need to think of social inequality as systems of power that are interdependent, mutually influence each other, and are contextually constructed. And third, I would like to remember that intersectionality is not only and maybe not even primarily uh, an intellectual project, but it is a political project. It comes from activism, particularly from the uh, activism of, of women, so of feminists uh, of color, and, and continues to be an idea, a set of ideas and practices inspiring the work of many social justice movements around the globe. So in my view, uh, the commitment to social change is central to intersectionality as a critical theory. Sometimes people call it a critical praxis. It's, it's, it's really in an inherent element of this theory. So having laid out this uh, minimal set of principles, and I want to focus on three ways in which I see intersectionality as relevant to the study of welfare state and social policy, providing some illustration from my own research on care. Now I call these three things uh, the, the policy, political, the policy, uh, sorry, the normative policy and political problems. So the normative problem has to do with the definition of what are the ultimate goals of social policy. And as such, it involves decision about what we think social policies, that's the state, ought to achieve, and possibly some metric to, to measure this. It is important to have an open discussion uh, about this principle, these normative goals, uh, not only because they form the basis of the legitimacy of, of, of welfare state, but also because they provide substantive criteria against which we can evaluate them. Now, different goals have been attributed to the welfare state, but generally they include the reduction of inequalities, um, but only some inequalities and not all of them. So historically, the emphasis has been on class inequality and, and increasingly disability and gender inequality have been institutionalized in, in welfare state, maybe not, I would say, effectively addressed, but at least institutionalized. But there are many other inequalities that are, are basically still at the margin of the welfare state. So the, the emphasis that welfare state, different welfare state put on different forms and dimensions of inequalities varies greatly depending on the particular geographies and issue that we consider. If we take the issue of care, for instance, which is central to how welfare state deal with gender inequalities, we should consider that care, it's not an issue that affects only women. Actually, it affects us all. And I think the COVID-19 made that very clear. Now, definition of how equality in care should be achieved have been said that we have several formulations of how equality in care, in, in care should be achieved. So some people stress the need to, uh, to transform the unequal division of, rep uh, of reproductive work between men and women. Others say it's about promoting um, women's, uh, the value of women's unpaid work in their home. And others still say it's about supporting individuals to make, you know, uh, to, to make choices about how much they want to engage in care and work uh, across their life course. And other formulations still include other things like the right of children uh, to have uh, um, to, uh, to equal opportunities, regardless of, of their socioeconomic backgrounds, or even the rights of people uh, in need of care to be able to choose autonomous, uh, in autonomy about their care arrangements. Now, this is a non-exhaustive list, but it, it includes some of the most common used, commonly used formulation of equality, uh, equality in care. Now, what we see here is that each of these formulations put a different emphasis on some subjects, problems, and resources. 
So each of these formulations give primacy to some social groups and has the potential to abandon them at the expense of others. So from the point of view of intersectionality, dealing with the normative uh, uh, problems means considering how different equality and social justice principle bear uh, different implications for different social groups and, um, and subgroups, which are located differently on multiple uh, dimensions of inequality. In my view, thus an intersectional analysis of the normative principle guiding social policy should as a minimum ask whose equality and which principles have the greatest chance of simultaneously advancing the position of multiple disadvantaged social groups. Moving on to the, to the second problem, the policy problem. And these problems are of course interconnected, these three problems. Now the policy problems involves the question of, of how we design and evaluate social problem, social policies in a way that takes into account the whole range of inequalities touched upon a particular issue. From an, an intersectionality perspective, the things that we should consider are, for instance, to which extent a policy favors some subgroups at the expense of others and creates some kind of trade-offs. So, an example of this negative situation relates, for instance, to measure that incentivize the creation of um, care markets of cheap labor. Now, the availability of private nannies, often migrant women working long hours, flexible hours for not so high wages, is in many, in many countries an important condition for the entry of native, highly educated women in the labor market and for the career perspective. And this is even more so when, um, when the, the, there, are public, there are limited public facilities for care. Thus, in this case, we see that greater equality for this group of women is achieved in ways that arms another group of women. And we could ask ourselves to which extent is equality being advanced by this policy at all. An intersectional approach to policy analysis might also, also ask a different kinds of questions. It could ask, for instance, the extent to which apparently similar issues are dealt with differently by policy targeting different social groups. In the same context, the problem of work-life balance can be constructed as an issue of expanding childcare services for highly educated women and one of controlling the childbearing decision of minority and poor people by, for instance, introducing a limit to the number of children for which one is entitled to receive benefits, as is currently in the UK. Let's in fact not forget that the state has always tried to exert control on the fertility, on the fertility decision of certain groups. The final problem, the political problem. Now the political problem focuses on social and political struggles surrounding the welfare state. Let's take again the issue of care. Of course, there are political parties that legislate on care, but beyond political parties, there are several other actors that mobilize to try to influence care policies. These are women and feminist movements, organizations representing children's rights or the rights of disabled people, association of informal carers, employers, trade unions, migrant associations, given the widespread involvement in the provision of care. And this is not exhaustive list again. Each of these actors advances a slightly different set of demands often. Women's group have mostly spoken for the rights of mothers and other caregivers, organization of disabled people, stress, empowerment, autonomy, independence. Trade union increasingly support family-friendly and work-life balance policy for working men, women. It wasn't the case, but it is today. But they have not been so good in representing migrant care workers. And because of this, migrant care workers have often have to organize on their own to demand decent working condition. Now, some of these groups have more members, resources and power and institutional accesses than others. So from an intersectional perspective, three issues are of particular re relevance. First, how these groups organize um, as to conceal or rather manifest and give voice to the diversity of inequalities within them. I call this intersectionality within. The second is which political strategies they use and, and, and do they create opportunities for short or long-term forms of cooperation or rather lead to competition and conflict between them. And I call this intersectionality between groups. And the third one that is also in power, it's like, you know, across all, a power and identity really like, you know, are across all these points. But the third one is who do politicians listen to? Which groups or coalition of groups 
have the ability and resources to enter the institutional arena of, for instance, the legislative power and the power to influence policy making. The advantage of intersectionality to study the politics of social policy is that it broadens the notion of politics to include social movements and other actors loca located outside of what we call formal politics. Another advantage is that it deals explicitly and makes visible the range of inequalities that particular issues engage and the ways they are politicized. And it makes power and the way in which it works in coalition as well as in the institutional arena a central concern of the analysis. So to conclude, in this talk, I've tried to suggest three ways in which intersectionality is useful to address classical problem of welfare state research. But I also think something else, I think that we need a broader incorporation of the insight of intersectionality in welfare state study. So if you think about welfare state study, is this is the study of how states treat inequalities, right? So I think at this point, um, and, and it's a discipline that with a long history, but it would be useful for this discipline to reflect on its own blind spots in terms of which range of inequalities, phenomena and processes have been studied in which have remained concealed. And there are many. Thank you. And look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Rosella. I think you give us a real insight into how intersectionality can be used in, in welfare state studies, what it can tell us about the mobilization of of care workers and these three dimensions of, of the normative, the policy and the political, I think show that intersectionality is, is not just an analytical lens, but also is, is part of the praxis, as, as the term you used, of how groups can mobilize for advocacy and transformation within a particular sector. So we'll move to Nick now, who I think will take a bit of a political historical turn in how he looks at the topic. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, um, Alex. And, and thank you very much indeed, everyone, for the opportunity to, um, to come together in this way. I think it's, it's enormously valuable. I wish there had been things like this around when I was a graduate student. Um, so my name's Nick Owen. Um, I'm, for, for reasons I'm going to explain, um, I am not very well qualified to talk about intersectionality. But in fact, that incapacity, um, that lack of authority, if you like, is actually my subject. And so I'm really speaking today um, about why and when I shouldn't speak. Um, and I work on social movements, and perhaps there's quite a nice bridge here from some of the things Rosella was saying in her, her last of her three sections um, about the politics of intersectionality. I work on um, the problem of outsiders in social movements, by which I mean people are in a social movement in the sense that they are activists, they put resources into the movement, in other words, but they're not direct beneficiaries of that movement, meaning that they don't stand to gain directly um, if that movement succeeds. So examples might include figures like men in women's movements, um, middle class people in workers' movements, white people in anti-colonial movements. And some of those examples are ones I've researched historically um, for the book that Alex mentioned at the start, Other People's Struggles, which um, came out last year. And the research question of that book is really how, how when, and, and, and why are these outsiders sometimes present and sometimes unproblematically so? And how, when and why are they problematically present or indeed absent? Who can struggle on behalf of others? And so more recent terms that um, are the ally, the advocate, um, are used a lot in, in social movements at the moment to try and capture this, this phenomenon of the outsider. So, so there are lots of ways to wonder about that, that question. Um, one way is to approach it um, as a political philosopher might approach it. So you start with some abstract concepts, um, freedom, autonomy, representation, perhaps. And then you try and think, well, what, what, if we believe in those things, what does that imply about the question of who can struggle uh, for the rights of other people? And now I, I don't think that has much been done in political philosophy. Um, I think it should be. But in any event, I'm quite underqualified to do it. Um, so instead, I approach the question um, as, a, as a, a political historian, which is my own methodological background. And I just want to give you a kind of historical um, uh, example, really, to try and, try and flesh out what it is I, I try to do. So if, you, if we throw our minds back um, to the period before the First World War, and I'm thinking here about Britain because that's my, my research area. But in fact, this might, might work elsewhere too. But if you go back to Edwardian pre-First World War Britain, there are lots of social struggles 
in evidence, uh, and most obviously three, um, the struggle for racial equality, which at that time was strongly focused on opposing colonialism, Britain being a huge colonial power, um, the struggle for women's rights, which is focused on that time, in that time on the, um, the campaign for votes for women, the suffrage campaign, and the class struggle, um, focused at that time on workers' rights, most obviously in trade unions and the newly founded Labour Party. Now, if we look at those, um, those three struggles, um, we find something that's very distinctive of this period, which is a very heavy presence of white middle class men in all of them. Um, and they don't dominate. Um, the, the, uh, the various repressed groups are certainly much more numerous, in certain senses also much more um, uh, uh, in, in important senses, the movement is clearly their movement and it belongs to them. Still, there they are, um, the middle class white men, um, very much involved, advocating for speaking, advising, making decisions, sometimes even in roles of leadership in those organisations. And the movements at the time find some value in that, it seems, to judge by their own records. Um, movements which are excluded from power do sometimes find value in outsiders who can open doors for them, provide access to power holders who can lobby, perhaps even share their expertise in how, it, you know, how best um, to run a social movement. OK, it's a very quick picture. Now, throw ourselves forward to the 1960s and 1970s. Many more social struggles, clearly. I'm going to focus on one just to make the point, which is the women's liberation movement, which in Britain sort of kicks off in 1967-68 in an organised form. And this movement very quickly becomes a women only space. Um, there are some men there at the start, interestingly, um, mo mostly men of the left, keen as ever to be at the, the battlefront of the, the latest struggle. Um, but the women throw the men out in about 1971, 72. And the women's liberation movement in Britain and elsewhere, I think too, um, becomes for various reasons and with various difficulties, a movement that is um, a struggle just of women um, for women and by women, crucially as well. And it's a feature of the period more generally, all sorts of examples of social movements who kind of all adopt a slogan of nothing about us without us, which is that came up first of all in disabled people's movements, but also ethnic groups, sexuality movements. In a lot of these cases, you get people speaking for themselves and being quite insistent that that is a major part of what their movement is about. And this is often loosely and maybe not very helpfully summed up as identity politics, the beginnings of identity politics. So there's something about identity politics that makes these outsiders problematic. Um, and identity politics, of course, is, is a politics not so much of what we want as a politics of, of who we are. And its key demand, arguably, is for recognition. So recognition of the distinctness of the needs of a group. Uh, the distinctness of its identities, of its experiences, and of its desires. And outsiders clearly lack all those things. The movement rests um, on desires they don't feel, on needs they don't have, on experiences they haven't had either. And so they can't easily share in the movement's work. But it's interesting in these movements of the, of the late 60s and 70s, there are still some attempts for the outsiders to make contributions. And these often take the form of interpretation. So um, if we follow Marx um, in the belief that the oppressed are not always best placed to understand their own oppression, they may be best placed to know what it's like to be oppressed, but they may not be best placed to understand their own oppression, then maybe outsiders can help with providing that sort of understanding. And Marxists quite often think that. And if we follow Freud um, in his claim that we are not always transparent to ourselves, then outsiders can help us to draw out what our real desires are, despite our resistance. And psychotherapists, of course, often think that. But these movements learned, as well, perhaps we've all learned, to be um, somewhat skeptical of Marxists and psychotherapists and the agendas they brought with them. And so this notion that people understand themselves best and are therefore best placed to advocate for people like them is, is, is a strongly robust and firmly held one, I think, and it's become a, a very emphatic feature of identity politics. Right, so to intersectionality, then I, I promised I'd get there. Um, so I, I take the central insight of um, intersectionality then to be the claim that um, identities are multiple and that they cut across each other in various ways, and that there are particular understandings that are only to be found at those intersections and not elsewhere. 
And so my question then, I think, is what does that mean for social movements? And especially what does it mean for solidarity in those social movements? How do movements which embrace that conception of intersectionality address this problem of outsiders, of allies, of advocacy, of people speaking in the name of others? And I just want just to give really quickly just two visions of that solidarity for our times, if you like, both of which I see, I think, in contemporary movements of this kind, of which the two I, I've begun to work on now are queer politics and also the outer globalization movement. Um, and one direction um, is to be, if you like, more intense about identity. Classically, identity politics um, of the um, 1970s would ask for your credentials. Where do you speak from? What's your positionality? Um, and one effect of intersectionality, I think, is that it intensifies that question. It raises that question more often. Who are you? Who do you speak for? What's your, what are your credentials for speaking? And identities, when intersectionality comes into play, I think really proliferate. They get longer and more complex, so there's simply more of them. The names of identities, which perhaps used to be quite short, women, black, whatever the identity was, has a short name, they, they become more complex, rather like um, those Linnaean biological names, you know, which endlessly kind of hyphenated, um, uh, and, and they get extended that way into very long versions of what people identities are, and then they get contracted into acronyms, of course, because the long hyphenated name is too, is too long to say. And one, one possible effect of this, not a necessary effect, but one possible effect is then to kind of fragment solidarity or at least make it harder to build. Solidarity becomes, the movement becomes a kind of building of many separate rooms at all, at, at the entrance to each of which your, your credentials are checked um, and at, on every threshold. And that can also become, in ways that are um, perhaps also problematic for these movements, a kind of alibi that if nobody can speak for anybody else, it's a crude way of summarising it, but if that becomes more difficult, then more people can say, I, can't, I really can't say anything about this movement. I really, I really, it's not my place to say. And so the alibi, which allows people to slide out of their commitments and their obligations to others becomes, becomes a more prominent thing. But perhaps there are ways in those movements to rethink solidarity. And the second and final way, I think, is almost the reverse of that. So if the first view is that you know, become, let's become more intense and more detailed about identity, the other view, I think, which you also see in queer politics, is to be more relaxed about identity. So identities become very light and very fluid. And here the kind of insight is that you know, maybe we're just too different from each other in all these many Linnaean dimensions for identities to settle down at all. And yet somehow we all still share something, whatever our many, many differences across all the cross-cutting different dimensions, whatever our differences, we share something in the incompleteness of our identities, the way that we're all continually making and remaking ourselves or performing who we are in the Judith Butler kind of way, um, or the way that we're all unmoored or rootless or insecure. So it's all a post-structuralist influenced um, uh, approach, I think. And then the idea, of course, would be, well, credential checking then goes out of the window, as it were. You don't, nobody has any right to check anybody else's credentials because after all, we, our identities are all fluid and anyone can speak to anyone. Um, and indeed for anyone. And of course, the problems there arise too, and just two very quickly. One is that the distinctness of identities therefore kind of dissolves, um, I think. So people start to think, well, nobody is, nobody is taking me seriously as me with my identity. It's all just too fluid for there to be any secure base for identity claims to be made personally and politically. And of course, finally, you know, it reintroduces the outsider again. You know, look, there he is popping up again like a rubber duck and often claiming too, as well, to be identityless. Um, so everybody else has identities, well, except, except that man we met earlier on who claims to be identityless and whose identity is not in question and wishes to continue campaigning in the name of securing other people's identities without ever quite asking about his own. So anyway, so to, the, the deep interest to me of intersectionality then is that it raises this problem, which I want to argue has um, deep historical roots to the level of a contemporary dilemma to which I think there is no, no contemporary solution. We're all living at the moment, the working through of that of that problem. OK, thanks. Sorry to have overrun a bit. Thanks, Nick. Um, a really fascinating insight into how intersectionality changes, how you reflect on who can struggle on whose behalf. 
Um, and, and in a way, kind of the intersectional dilemma of, of the positive side is it allows us to recognize and engage with social movements from different perspectives. The potential downside is that um, identities proliferate to such an extent that it creates a dilemma of who can speak from within, but then legitimates potentially speaking from, from outside. Very interesting. Now, we'll move to Nikita, and I think there's an interesting segue from Nick. In a way, you reflected on the positionality of the advocate, and I know, Nikita, you're going to reflect a bit on the positionality of the researcher. Yeah, so thank you for this opportunity. It's really nice to hear colleagues from different departments. And even though we um, did not speak to each other before this, I actually touch on what each of them said about the welfare state and about you know, the positionality of outsiders. Um, so I, I wanted to reflect on the question in a sort of methodological way. And I will begin by drawing a very quick trajectory of you know, how, how research has panned out over the last 100 or 200 years um, with my sort of historians hat on. Um, so you know, if you look at sort of classical texts in sociology and you know, various other social science disciplines, there is this idea that there is a reality out there that the researchers study. It's almost like a lab and very much mapping on from the natural sciences. So there's this, you know, there's lots of work on, you know, the evolution of society, stages of development, savagery to civilization, etc. Um, by the time we come to the 20th century, sort of mid 20th century churning, and also the influence of feminism and post-colonialism, subaltern so studies, etc., it's very clear that there is no reality out there that people are studying. Uh, you know, reality is very subjective, and it depends on you know where we are coming from, what we are seeing. Um, so, for instance, you know. Think of classical studies of agriculture where people like Bina Garwal in India, Esther Bostrup from Denmark, um, go to various parts of Africa and Asia and uh, you know, tell us that actually we've been talking and making policy around male farmers, whereas the vast majority of farmers in the world are women. Uh, and it takes you know, women like them to you know, actually go and, and give us this, uh, you know, this uh, piece of knowledge, which you know, staggeringly has been ignored in so much policy making in the mid 20th century. Um, and later on in the 20th century, with constructivism in various fields of knowledge making, it's very clear that not only is reality and knowledge making very subjective, but we construct it. So, you know, who we are matters when we go into the field. We are not some sort of neutral observers looking at lab-like situations. We are very much part of the research conditions that we are looking at and constructing along the way. Um, so I, I wanted to use that as a backdrop for the kind of work I do, and I hope you know, that will become clear as I'm speaking. So I, I work across scales and my more recent work has been on um, the making of the global south across time, across racial spaces, continents, etc. So you know, intercontinental work and also how climate change debates are constructing the global south. Um, but when I, I started off uh, as a researcher, my work was very micro, very village level. And I thought I would, I would draw on that work to talk about some of the issues we are talking about today. So I, in across my work, uh, continents, a country like India or village level in uh, different parts of South Asia, uh, the underlying interest that I have followed has been about how states and markets interact, particularly as um, globalization, liberalization opens up economies. Um, and in this sort of process, it's very clear that as states open up to the forces of the market, they also have to speak to their citizens through, uh, for instance, welfare provision, uh, or at least seeming to provide welfare and meet the needs of their populations, even as they're embracing capital increasingly. So in this country, for instance, even though the NHS is more and more stretched and we keep hearing about privatization and nurses threatening to go on strike, you know, we still have number 10 uh, clapping for carers very prominently and a big show being made, made of that. Um, so the micro research I'm talking about here is, is from India where that is very much in evidence. So from the 1990s, India has increasingly embraced 
uh, the market economy, globalization, the sort of dance between the elite state and big capital, global capital, regional capital. But there has also been a proliferation of welfare provision, or at least the you know appearance of uh, pro proliferating welfare. So I wanted to, in this micro work, go to the village scale and see how this state provision of welfare is being received and interacted with. So not sort of seeing like the state in a Jim Scott way, but how the state is seen um, from below. Um, and I chose a village uh, in Western India in, in a state called Gujarat where you know poverty rates were very high and welfare provision was also very high in a sort of staggering array. So, um, old age pensions, widow pensions, skills development, uh, self-help groups for women, micro, all sorts of things. Um, so I wanted to see how this is panning out. And I chose to look at women uh, because there was an emphasis by the state and its various schemes on targeting women. Uh, I think underlying that is this idea that, you know, if you reach a woman, you reach a family uh, and all sorts of, you know, other considerations, but government schemes were going in that direction. And I had an interest in gender and development uh, schemes of the state. So, you know, that's, that's where I targeted my attention. Um, when I went to the village after you know, choosing it, and I can in the Q&A discuss that a bit further, um, I had to go with an interlocutor and that would be the sort of village level worker, the micro level government functionary who interacts uh, with various constituencies in the village and is also the implementer and you know, information giver around these various programs. And the village level worker I went with immediately took me to this sort of showpiece um, locality within a village of about 7,000 people uh, where a lot of government schemes were in process. And uh, you know, I had conversations with people, it was all very interesting, but it was clear that these were women, but they were um, upper caste women. And if, you, if you're familiar with India or South Asia, uh, you, know, you know that caste is a system of social stratification uh, determined by occupation. It's very rigid and determined often by birth. So if I'm born into a sweeper caste or if I'm born into a priest caste, my, you know, my life is sort of absolutely fixed. I cannot change occupation. Uh, and I, how I'm treated in society would be completely different based on my caste location. So the, the women that the village level worker, government worker takes me to are upper caste women just like him. Uh, so there is welfare provision, but there is a, you know, there is a bias in the way the state delivers this welfare because you know, welfare is embedded in identities, in gender, in caste, in class, in religion. Um, so I, after a few visits with this village level work, I decide to branch out a bit on my own and I start walking around the village just to get a sense of, you know, what else lies behind, you know, beyond what I'm being shown in the official picture. Um, and I, I go and start, uh, you know, initially the houses where I do my field research are concrete and brick uh, and they are poor, but you know, there are levels of poverty. And as I walk to the peripheries of the village, the houses start becoming more and more, um, you know, what, what we call kacha, which is sort of, in, uh, you know, impermanent or, you know, made of thatch and made of hay and made of mud. Um, and that is where I, I start focusing my inquiries more and more, um, which creates, and this is where, you know, my positionality as a researcher comes in, it creates a, you know, furor in the village, um, because I'm told, you know, this is a polluting area, a young woman from an urban context like you, and it is assumed I'm upper caste, I'm not, but uh, you know, it is assumed that based on how I look or talk or where I come from, a foreign university, etc. Um, so I'm told I shouldn't go there, it is dangerous. Um, the the bank manager, the state bank manager who disburses the funds for welfare schemes tells me that you know, these are undeserving people um, because they cannot adhere to the sort of government rules. There's a lot of corruption, etc. Um, and there are you know, all sorts of attempts to push me back to the official picture. 
Um, but what I find more and more as I sit with these women is that, you know, the women from the patched houses, um, that they're very keen to have someone like me come and talk to them about welfare provision, about their relationship with the state. Um, and very interestingly, um, just as I am researching them, they are using my presence to gain some legitimacy with government workers. So, you know, some government workers follow me. They don't want to just let me go and do my thing. So, um, in a way, the government worker and the bank manager start accompanying me to these hamlets where they have not gone before or, you know, where the state has had less of a presence. Um, so my identity and my position as a, a researcher based at Oxford University influences how these women, these lower caste women, um, are seen by the state and how they interact with the state. That has all sorts of repercussions and that brings us to the fields of power um, you know, question underlying today's discussion. One day I, I come back from this hamlet very happily after a day of interviews and I find my car, my, my hired car's windscreen shattered. Um, so I'm being told to stay away. I don't know who did it, but clearly that was a you know, sign that I should stay away from, from this research. Uh, so you know, going back to what I started with, it was not just that I was looking at gender intersecting with caste and seeing how the state interacts with uh, these cross-cutting identities, but I was very much part of the field of research. Uh, the women from the thatched houses were, you know, trying to uh, use my presence to be noticed by a village level worker or a bank manager who had been ignoring them. Um, the Brahmins uh, were upset with what I was doing and decided to you know, teach me a lesson. So I was very much in the field of what this, uh, you know, of the state welfare provision that I had gone to study. Uh, and I think in, in this sort of seminar, that is important to underline. And I can talk more about the research I did. It got published and I can, I can you know, point people in that direction. Uh, but I think as researchers, we, we may not reflect enough on what we do to our research fields and how our own identities as English speaking, urban, female, or whatever else you are, um, influence the, the fields of power within which our own research is carried out. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks, Nikita. That's a fascinating window into your research world and, and how your identity affects how you navigate a field context across caste, gender, nationality, uh, and a host of other facets of identity, urban, rural. Um, please, if you've got questions, put them into the Q&A. Um, Susan, do you, do you have a question or a starting point for us? Uh, there are some interesting questions from, from our audience, so I'm going to dive straight into those if it's okay with the panel. Um, Isabel has, has said, <clears throat> I find the idea of outsiders in other people's struggles fascinating and would love to hear a bit more about where whiteness or racial, racialization more broadly as an analytical category comes into Professor Owen's work. So one for you, Nick. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, I mean, whiteness is an ex for me is an example of the, 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 something I was mentioning, I think, right at the end, which is um, the kind of unseen identity, um, which forms around the edge of these movements, typically around outsiders. So it was very characteristic of um, outsiders when they were more present and more welcome, that they would regard themselves as identity less. So they would regard their work as being to um, draw out and sustain and develop the identities of other people from a position of, of more or less invisibility, if you like. I mean, their own identities didn't come into question. And that is almost invariably challenged. I mean, whiteness will be a great example of that, pointing out that, that white people have identities too, and that those are privileged identities has obviously been a really big part of the um, uh, debates really for 30 or 40 years, but keeps, coming, um, keeps becoming more acute. Similarly, the demands of feminists that men regard themselves as also possessing gendered identities and that men are not neutral figures who simply have to, <clears throat> if they are sympathetic to feminism, have to lend their support 
support to women's identities being more realized and uh, expressed and so forth is another big part. So, so, it, so it comes into my work, I guess, as, as being one of the really, really key um, aspects of the, the, the dilemma that I work on. But thanks for the question. Uh, and I guess uh, while we're with you, Nick, um, Almas has a, a, a not unrelated question, which relates, I think, to your intersectionality dilemma, which is would practicing intersectionality affect the collective agency of social movements? How do we address that while holding on to the theory of intersectionality? Thank you. That's a great question. I think it turns somewhat on the movement. And um, so a concept I use in the book is orientation <clears throat> and also ambition to the two related concepts. And the idea is that um, a lot of these dilemmas turn very much on what the movement is trying to do. And so, um, so, so in some cases, agency is really assisted by the presence of outsiders, most obviously when movements are seeking to influence power holders outside the movement. Um, if they're weak movements, they, they kind of need the outsiders to open the doors for them, for example. But there are other types of movement most obviously concerned with empowerment or with the expression of identities, for example, all the building of movement solidarity itself where the presence of the outsider is really problematic. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so the, the value for agency is gonna turn for me very much on what activities the movement is pursuing and the level of ambition with which they intend to pursue that, um, that, 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 that particular goal. In terms of how we hang on to uh, agency whilst addressing intersectionality, I think that is the active work of many movements at the moment. I mean, I agree 100% with what Rosella said, that the concept of intersectionality is being worked out I think I would say even more in activist work than it is, you know, in academic work because it's so urgent as a question, and this this is this is precisely the question that 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 is that troubles these movements about advocates and allies. It arose in Black, it arose in Black Lives Matter, for example, last year, um, the issue of um, white support and what form that could have, and all sorts of things are being pursued. I mean, from the the withdrawal and the separation, which has been one classic answer to it, so just leave, leave us to our movement, through to the ideas of forms of um, allyship that are um, less intrusive um, and less uh, full of risk. Um, the most obvious one, I don't want to dominate the discussion, so I'll, I'll just raise it and then, and then, and then move on, but um, is money. The thought that actually the appropriate thing for the outsiders just give us the money because money is the classic i could say this in the social sciences division money is a classic fungible resource you know you can do what you like with money so it's not you're not threatening anybody if you give them money and the only counter argument to that which i find a really fascinating one is this idea that if you think about money as a gift you know if your if your relations give you money as a gift you always have a sort of slight sense. It's a bit of a chilly gift to have given. It's not very thinking. It's just a sort of way, I, I don't know what you want, have some money. And, and in that sense, some people, some movements have regarded the money gift as a sort of too detached um, a form of engagement because it's a chilly form of gift. And they sort of want people to do more and get involved. And they see money rather as the stereotype of the Victorian sort of throwing money in, in, in a charitable way in order not to have to engage more directly with other people's lives. So I think it's a travesty of the Victorians. But anyway, classically, people think the Victorians did that. They just threw money at problems rather than really engaging with them. And that becomes the other side, if you like, of that, that feature of the, of the dilemma. Thanks, Nick. That's, um, it, it's fascinating. I'm, just, I'm finding this evening's talk so interesting. Um, there, there's a question um, in the audience. Um, there's, there's one for you, Nikita, um, and then there's a more general one. Um, someone asking, how do you think intersectionality works in reporting of crimes of power, such as rape, where the victim and the rapist might belong to different classes, caste, gender, and or religion? It's a big question. It's a very, uh, and I'm going to give a very academic, maybe frustrating answer. Um, I think for, like I was talking about the research process and the researcher being removed from it uh, and you know needing to recognize how we're in it rather than looking at a lab, uh, the state in a similar way uh, would like to be above society almost, right? They, they like to rule from above, even if, though they want to be close to the people, um, the, it is, it is important to acknowledge how embedded the state is in gender, in caste, in religion, et cetera. So when you look at 
uh, you know, rape trials, for instance, there's, there's fascinating work on how um, views of the state around gender and around gendered behaviors influence um, how rape trials proceed. And I think the first step in bringing in an intersectional analysis is to acknowledge how steep the state is in, um, in identity and fields of power. Um, so very academic answer, not a policy or practical one, but I think before you go in the policy direction, you have to recognize what's going on. Thank you, Nikita. There's a really general question, which is how can researchers go about applying intersectionality to their future research? And, and I just want to take that question, which I think is quite an inspiring starting point, and just focus it a little bit by asking you, What's the one idea that you've got for how you would apply intersectionality in the next steps of your work? If you were to take forward the concept, relating it to what you do, how would it shape what you do next? Maybe I can try this since I haven't spoken so far. I think my interest in a, di in a different area, in a different way, are not that different from what Nicholas Owen was, was talking about. So the thing that interests me now is like this, especially this political intersectionality and the politics of solidarity. And I see solidarity not necessarily as a gift, but as a working together, but which is like, you know, understanding each other, developing a language, connecting social justice struggles and sharing resources. I think money is important. <laughs> I disagree. I think money is part of the picture. So to me, really, like, you know, it is about understanding when do these movements that, re, like, you know, that, that rotate around the politics of care and care really lends itself, uh, um, decide to take each other on board in a way. So it is about the way they talk to each other. It is about the institutional environment. So how they get, who gets co-opted and how, and how this impact finally inequalities. And I think there is a broader concern that I have is that often when we talk about inequality, we take someone's perspective, right? So it can be, you know, the care workers or the mothers or this and that. And, and I would like to understand because social movement have done this much better than us academics. Sometimes I have the feeling when I talk to them, I would like to understand is there ways to like, you know, kind of minimize, you know, the differences between those goals and try to like, you know, bring them forward together. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I mean, it is uh, also I, I recognize myself in what Nikita says about some positionalities. I sometimes as a white, you know, middle class woman, uh, heterosexual, I feel uncomfortable uh, in all of this because I cannot claim membership to any of those. Um, I feel like I cannot claim membership to all of those struggles. So it's also working through that uneasiness, I think, for me, as part of my, my work on intersectionality. Nikita, do you want to go next? Or? Sure, I can take a shot. <laughs> so uh, going forward in, in work on, you know, how the South is uh, being constructed in the climate change debate, um, there is, I'm very early in the process, but there is this sort of making of a we, so we need to reduce, uh, you know, carbon emissions and, you know, 1.5 is the goal. Um, and that we is sort of this universal scientific truth that is being constructed. And then there's the indigenous perspective where you go to people in the Amazon or, you know, Aborigines in Australia and you look at their perspectives where we are freezing these identities. So there's the scientific universal and then there is the indigenous, which is almost frozen in time. Um, and I, I very desperately want to problematize these identities uh, and not have them so frozen. I don't know where I'll take it, but identity and intersecting identities will be part of you know, what I do. I think speaking for myself, I, I would like to do more on contemporary movements. So I've studied this as a historical problem. And I've kind of produced a framework for looking at it, but um, it's, it's continually evolving right at the edge and, and amongst movements that are active now. 
And I don't, this is, you know, obviously about research methods in part, my research methods have really been to bury myself in archives and not too much talking to people. And so I'll need to retool myself in terms of, you know, the research methods that are appropriate for talking to contemporary movements, many of which are actually movements of the young. And it's another <clears throat> cross-cutting dimension we haven't yet mentioned. We mentioned all the, all the many of the other ones, but we haven't mentioned um, generation and age. But it's, it, I, for me, that's clearly one in this, in this area that a lot of the dilemmas I've been describing are amongst movements of the young of various kinds. And there probably are all sorts of research methodological questions about how aging academics, in my case, um, you know, to connect, connect with, um, um, with movements of young people and how they research them. Um, and that's a dilemma I think I'll have to I'll have to think through a great deal. But um, but yeah, I'm you know that's the, what what I would love to do next certainly. There are some interesting questions around um, field research and intersectionality, and and someone's asked about you know if your field research is primary if your your research is primarily in the field. Um, how would as researchers we would then practically consider positionality in an um, intersectional way with more desk based um, research and and how um, how we would go about that who would like to have a go at that how would we Nikita they, they do mention you by name <laughs> um, I think what one there can be many answers to this but one way if you know you're doing archival documentary sort of research is thinking about researching with the grain and against the grain, like, you know, the historian Ann Stoller would say, for instance. Um, and when you're researching with the grain, you know, who are you that is doing this research? And when you reverse that gaze, um, who are you aligning with? Uh, you know, what is the perspective through which you're doing the reading? So archives or documents, and as we know, and as your question is suggesting, are not at all neutral. Uh, and when we read with or against the grain, we are certainly not neutral either. So questions of power and identity would have to come in, um, even in that kind of work. Can I ask a question sort of from the other end and, and, and feeds into what Nick was saying a little bit about, you know, how we would go about future research and gaining access. And we talk a lot in social sciences research about gaining access to certain groups and, and you know, using an intersectionality framework. But one of the things that we talk less about is, and particularly with, with groups where they can be different to what our normal experiences are, how we exit those groups. So in this sort of, when you're using these frameworks and, you know, we all then sort of, our, our research connects, but we move away. And particularly for our doctoral students who it, it is a very sort of almost quite clear sometimes period of time. How have you experienced exiting through um, the methodologies that you've adopted with, with an intersectionality framework? I mean, Nikita, maybe you could start with, because, you know, you spoke about going into the villages. I mean, how do you then come out of them? I was just thinking about Nick's point earlier about working with younger people. Uh, I was thinking that so many of my field sites I have never exited because I'm on Facebook with some of my interlocutors. So there is no neat uh, division. And um, perhaps that depending on the topic, that may not be a bad thing because, you know, otherwise it is so extractive to go in mm. and do your three months or one year or whatever work and then just cut the cord and come out. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, I, I still get inquiries about, you know, admissions to higher education institutions or will you read my, you know, I've written for this newspaper or I'm doing this, will you read it? And with social media or, you know, the internet on the phone everywhere, it is so possible to stay in touch. Um, I don't cut the cord. In some cases, yes, if it is getting too pushy, but mostly no. If people want to stay in touch, I stay in touch. Yeah. In my bit, though I haven't done a vast amount of field work, it's actually more of a struggle really to keep up with the evolving and changing movement, that it's continually spawning new groups. 
And so, in fact, the group's more likely to move on before you get a chance to, so I'm running to catch up more than I'm making an exit from a stable situation, I guess. And that, that, that's a larger challenge. Rosella, would you like to make a final comment? I was I was actually thinking about it, and I think it depends on on really the research situation. Um, so sometimes when I, I don't know, probably I felt like it was interviews with activists, and I felt committed. I felt I had to give something back. So even if it was just trying to you know try something from their perspective, you know. But other times, you know, I, I, I just, you know, think it's enough for me to think that I'm doing justice to their point of view and like, you know, and that I'm giving voice to a diversity of, uh, of voices to, that I'm including, like, you know, diversity of people that are uh, moving there. And finally, I think sometimes it's also about stepping back. So like, you know, I can't be the face or the voice um, speaking for, um, all kinds of issues. So sometimes I think it's also about creating opportunities for the people that were like participating in the research to actually take over uh, that, that space to speak. Um, and it's something I learned recently and I was really excited about. <laughs> I think that might be a wonderful point to end on. Very practical advice about not only reciprocity, but actually collaboration, participation, engaging in, in a substantive way. Um, this has been a great conversation, partly because all three of you have not only showcased the brilliant work you're doing, but been very generous and engaging in a conversation around a concept, intersectionality, that in some ways connects your work. But I think you've brought your ideas to the table to engage in a dialogue, and you've been very generous in responding to everyone's questions. So, Massive thanks, uh, Rosella, Nikita, Nick, um, for your time, your, your input, and to everyone who's joined us um, and asked such interesting questions. Um, we'll reconvene for Oxford Minds in two weeks with a focus on how we translate research into transformational impact. And we'll hear from inspiring researchers bringing real impactful change in areas from climate change uh, to education to rights and COVID-19. Um, so, good night and thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.